guys all ready? Ready. Here we go. There's an old saying, build a better mousetrap, and the world will beat a path to your door. Hatchery, coho, adult. But a fish trap? That's a different story. Fisherman Blair Peterson spent the last 20 years building a better fish trap. This contraption is the first commercial fish trap to operate in Washington state in 85 years. It's been redesigned to catch the hatchery fish that are man-made for harvest and protect the wild fish that swim right alongside them in the Columbia River. Wild steelhead, no previous tag. The fish that you want to save, the fish that's endangered, you can merely look at him and release him. When I say totally unharmed, it doesn't get any more unharmed than that. Blair says this is the key to saving endangered wild salmon. Although technically, it's illegal. Fish traps were banned in 1934. And bringing them back, even with the idea of saving salmon, is controversial. Believe it or not, this, this was over 100 years ago that these were in their, in their prime. And uh, for some reason, somehow, the hard feelings still exist to this very day about traps on the Columbia River. Some of those hard feelings are coming from commercial fishermen like Steve Fick. They've always used boats and gill nets to catch salmon on the Columbia. And they don't want to give that up for a new fishing method that might not pay off. Your bang for the buck isn't there. It has to do a better job than what's existing. He's reeling his net out into Young's Bay near Astoria in an area where hatchery salmon are swimming back to the pens they were raised in. When you lay this out, the cork line floats, the mesh sinks, and then you drift along, and in theory, the fish swims into it, and you catch the fish. Steve says the gillnet fleet has its own way of catching hatchery fish and protecting endangered salmon. And a lot of that is strictly enforced. They're only allowed to fish in certain locations at certain times. And they use different sized nets to catch certain species. So this is designed to catch a Chinook salmon about 12 to 20 pounds. You'll have incidental bycatch, but uh, not a lot. That bycatch is a big deal. It can mean accidentally killing endangered salmon. But Steve would rather improve the gill net than switch to a fish trap. We haven't found anything that's more selective. Throw that on there, just throw it on there. More efficient, more controllable from a management standpoint than the commercial net fishery that we have here. And it benefits the most people. There's a long history of conflict between gill netters and fish traps. This is a trap right here. That's why nowadays you only see the skeletons of fish traps in the Columbia River. See, all the way to the end. <laughs> All these pilings that you see through here, all the way across. To build a better fish trap, Blair studied the remnants of these old traps. Their pilings, like the fishing method itself, were left for dead more than 80 years ago. This was the heaviest concentration of fish traps in the Columbia River, hundreds some odd years ago. Fish traps were banned in Washington in 1934, basically because they caught too many fish. They harvested everything. There was not much management involved because the abundance was right here for the taking. And trust me, they took it. Some traps could catch up to 40,000 fish in one haul. Gill netters were also trying to catch those fish. They blamed the fish traps when salmon populations declined. So fish traps were banned in Oregon and Washington, but salmon runs continued to suffer from overfishing and hydroelectric dams. Now, the Columbia River is home to 13 threatened and endangered species of salmon and steelhead. And hatchery fish are produced to make up for the losses.
with millions of hatchery fish swimming alongside endangered species, fishermen have to be extremely careful to catch one. It's a wild fish, we gotta let it go. While protecting the other. That's why Blair started thinking about bringing back the fish trap. There were lots of these traps here. He dug up what might be the only records left of the traps that used to line the Columbia River. One of those old forgotten documents actually gave him a blueprint for how to build a fish trap of his own. This is the one, yes, that's John C. Peterson. That's my grandfather. In this particular blueprint, he actually put what the trap looked like as far as the distance of the pilings, the length of it, and that's what I ran with to begin with. You can see how old and dilapidated and the, the rotten old lines I put on it. Which the fish After a bit of dumpster diving, Blair had enough netting to build a prototype. He's built a fish trap museum of sorts in his gear shed. That was my grandfather, and that picture was taken in 1926. And they're spilling a trap there that's really close to the same location that, that we're at right now in the river. You guys all ready? Ready. To pull the whole thing together, Blair teamed up with an environmental group called the Wild Fish Conservancy. Together, they got a grant and a special permit to build an experimental fish trap. All right, got a hatchery steelhead, 720. The goal is to catch as many hatchery fish as possible. Uh, no previous day. Wild coho adult. And let the wild fish swim away unharmed. Here's how it works. The fish swim into a wall of netting on one end of the trap, called a lead. That netting directs the fish into a maze of mesh that leads to an inner chamber called the heart. The mesh then tapers down into a smaller square of netting known as the spiller. Hatchery, coho, adult. The spiller is emptied into a holding pen where each fish can be identified as either hatchery or wild. The hatchery fish are taken directly to Blair's fishing boat. The wild fish are released back into the river. Wild steelhead, no previous tag. It's certainly not how they ran the old fish traps. They had no rules, they had no regulations, they fished around the clock. And yes, they played a major role in the demise of the salmon on the Columbia River. The new trap is designed to protect wild fish. With this door, you, you can sort out your catch, um, remove your hatchery fish for selective harvest, and then you can um, release all your wild fish unharmed. For biologist Adrian Tui, hatchery fish pose a triple threat to the wild salmon and steelhead he's trying to save. They compete for food and habitat, and they can water down the gene pool if they interbreed. The wild adult coho. Then there's the risk that fishermen will accidentally kill wild salmon while trying to catch hatchery fish. With a fish trap, that's much less of a risk because research so far shows nearly 100% of the wild fish released from the trap survive. No, I, I really do believe this is the future um, for these fisheries, especially where you have threatened and endangered runs mixed in in hatchery and wild stocks. These fish, as you just saw, came from the trap. You can see there's absolutely no trauma with that fish. He is alive and well. He's not fighting for his life. He's not had a hook in his mouth. He does not in the gill net, or he's still struggling. You give it the one, I'll hold it. You just, just like that, Aaron, that's perfect. 645. Blair says gill netters have suffered from severe restrictions on their fishery. No tags. He knows because he was one of them. In the last 20 years, it has been on a crash course and a tailspin downhill. The gill netter in the Columbia River, nobody's been hit harder and taken a bigger beating on this river because of the lack of fish in these small communities with the fishermen in it. But he says the river needs someone to catch all the hatchery fish, even if it's not in a gill net. If you make that hatchery fish, which I want the hatcheries to do, they have to be harvested. 
Wild coho and dole. Wild steelhead. Right now, fish traps are still banned in Oregon and Washington. But Blair says the Columbia River and its endangered salmon need them back. I want that wild fish in these wild creeks producing wildly on their own. I believe that uh, we're obligated to save that fish. 